Welcome back to the Cosmic Companion. I'm James G. Maynard. Now today we're unraveling mysteries of the universe with our special guest, Harry Cliff, physicist from CERN and author of Space Oddity. So let's dive in, shall we? Once upon a time, astronomers gazed upon Mercury and scratched their heads in wonder. This tiny planet had an undeniably wonky orbit zipping around the sun in a way that didn't quite add up. Now some scientists were convinced that a hidden planet aptly named Vulcan was hiding on the opposite side of the sun from Mercury. But alas, Vulcan remained elusive. Instead, a hero emerged in the form of Albert Einstein and his groundbreaking theory of relativity. Einstein's genius laid the mystery of Mercury's weird orbit to rest, revealing that the planet's strange behavior was, a, was the result of space-time curvature around the massive Sun. Now, although his search for Vulcan ultimately proved a dead end, it paved the way for exciting discoveries in our cosmic neighborhood. During the quest for the phantom planet, astronomers stumbled up upon numerous unknown <laughs> asteroids, the rocky remnants from the formation of our solar system. So the next time you gaze upon Mercury's crisp white glow, remember the tale of its odd orbit and the cosmic detective story that unfolded in its wake. Now, supersymmetry is a theoretical concept that aims to fill in gaps in our current understanding of matter at its tiniest detail. It proposes that each known particle has an undiscovered superpartner with similar properties but differing spins and masses. Uh, the existence of superpartners could also help explain, could help explain why certain forces and particles behave the way they do. However, Experiments have yet to find any direct evidence of supersymmetry, leading to anomalies that might challenge this theory. Now, while some physicists argue supersymmetry might not lie at the foundations of matter after all, others insist it's merely a matter of adjusting a theory or continuing this search. Whatever, they, whatever it is, supersymmetry remains an enticing mystery. Next up, we're going to talk with Harry Cliff, physicist at CERN, about the strangest anomalies in the universe and his new book, Space Oddities. Join us for an interstellar joyride through the cosmos with the Cosmic Companion. Every week, our intrepid host, James G. Maynard, dives headfirst into the wildest corners of science, comedy, pop culture, and history. The Cosmic Companion takes you on a roller coaster of knowledge with entertaining dives into fascinating subjects. James is like your science-obsessed buddy who's always ready with a fun fact at a party. Oh, and what's yeah. a cosmic journey without some quality company? James rubs shoulders, figuratively of course, with the creme de la creme of the scientific world. We're talking brainiacs who decipher the laws of the universe, authors who craft stories that warp space and time, and developers who are building the future. Our cosmic guest list? Oh, it's star-studded. We've had the likes of Neil deGrasse Tyson, dinosaur expert Steve Brusati from Jurassic World, the legendary ocean explorer Sylvia Earle, a myriad of astronauts, actors, and a constellation of other awe-inspiring guests. But wait, there's more. The Cosmic Companion isn't just any show. We've got AI on our side. Hello. I am AI. Huh. Did you know that is a palindrome? We're talking mind-bending visuals, snazzy animations, original music, and soundscapes that'll make your eardrums do the moonwalk. Are you ready to embark on this epic journey? Head over to thecosmiccompanion.net and get ready to laugh, learn, and explore the mysteries of the universe. This week on The Cosmic Companion, we are delighted to be joined by Harry Cliff. Uh, he is an experimental physicist at CERN, he uses the Large Hadron Collider. Okay, so for all you geeks out there, and I know that's most of you, your eyes just lit up when I said Large Hadron Collider, didn't they? His new book, Space Oddities, uh, The Mysterious Anomalies Challenging Our Understanding of the Universe, just came out, and you should check it out. 
Welcome, but first this. Welcome to the show, Harry. Thanks for having me. It's really nice to be on. Excellent, excellent. So, um, can you give us a little bit, I mean, your book talks about, well, the mysterious anomalies challenging our understanding of the universe. So, can you give us a look at some of the, the coolest mysteries and conundrums out there? Yeah, maybe it's worth saying where the idea from the book came from. It actually came out of my own research at the LHC. If you follow any of the news from the Large Hadron Collider in the last 10 years, you will know probably two things, which is the, uh, my colleagues discovered the Higgs boson. I was not involved in that, alas, that was a different experiment, but they discovered the Higgs boson in 2012. And then we haven't found any signs of what we call new physics. So new particles that could explain mysteries like dark matter, for example. And if you went back 15 years and asked people what they hoped to find, there was a lot of optimism that something like that would show up. So supersymmetry or uh, extra dimensions of space, tiny black holes, but none of that new exciting stuff has appeared. Nature's been rather unkind to us. Um, but what has happened in the last decade or so is a number of strange results have started to appear in the data. So this is what we call anomalies, so essentially a measurement that doesn't line up with your theoretical expectations. And anomalies in physics are really exciting because historically they are often the first clues to some major shift in how you understand the universe. So my own experiment has had basically just get detected a bunch of these anomalies that all started to kind of coalesce and look as if they were pointing towards potentially something exciting, like a new fundamental force that we'd never seen before. And so that was kind of what sparked the idea for the books. The book is really about, well, five particular big anomalies that are doing the rounds in physics and cosmology at the moment. I'll, I can talk a bit about those in more detail, but also a bit of, yeah. <laughs> But also a bit about the role that anomalies have played in the history of physics and you know how they've shaped our current thinking and you know the both both positively and negatively because the thing about anomalies the thing that makes them a sort of dramatic story is they can they have this great promise they can promise a huge breakthrough but they can also deceive you and it's very easy to fool yourself into thinking that some little blip in your data is some profound new view of the universe when actually you didn't plug a cable in all the way or you know you made some some <laughs> sign error in your calculations. So you have to be very careful when you're dealing with these things. Hmm. So um, can you t give us a look at like, um, I think probably one of the big ones the people are most familiar with are probably the inconsistencies between quantum mechanics and theory of relativity, both of which have been proved to ridiculous levels, but mm. they don't really come together well, do they? That's that's right. I mean, that that is not really an anomaly in a sense. It's more of a, a theoretical problem. Um, so that's not the kind of uh, question I'm really addressing in the book that though. I mean, th that's really a quest for what we call a theory of everything. But anom an anomaly might be a clue to something like that. So a historic example, seeing as this cosmic companion, if you went back to the 19th century, there was a particular anomaly to do with the orbits of the planets in the solar system, particularly to do with the orbit of the planet Mercury, which right. basically astronomers we're trying to observe what are called transits of Mercury, where Mercury crosses the face of the sun, and they kept missing them by hours, sometimes by days. Basically, Mercury didn't seem to be obeying Newton's laws of gravity. And this was a real problem for decades, people pulling their hair out trying to figure out what the cause of this was. At one point, people believed they discovered a planet inside the orbit of Mercury known as Vulcan. Right. Yeah. Uh, and that was like actually discovered by a French astronomer and then undiscovered. Um, and eventually it was realized this sort of anomaly in Mercury's orbit was actually a clue to Einstein's theory of general relativity. It was the hint that there was something, you know, not quite right, not quite complete about Newton's law of gravitation. So that's an example of how these things can change our view. But I suppose in terms of what's happening now in cosmology, the really big anomaly that is occupying a lot of cosmologists at the moment is something called the Hubble tension, which is essentially a disagreement over how fast space is expanding. Um, and this has potentially really profound implications for how we think about the history of the universe, what the contents of the universe are, potentially even the form of the laws of gravity. And just so to briefly explain exactly what the nature of this anomaly is, basically there are, if you want to, the universe is expanding, it's been expanding since the Big Bang, all the galaxies are getting further and further apart. And there are two ways of measuring this. You can either, do the sort of what we call direct measurement where you look out into the sky and you look at galaxies and you measure how far away they are, which is actually very difficult to do because it's quite hard to tell if it's a big galaxy that's far away or a small galaxy that's close. 
and you measure how fast they're moving um, from the the Doppler shift of their or the red shift of their light that comes from the, the galaxy. So you can that's one way of doing it, and that allows you to measure the speed of expansion. The other way is you look at the cosmic microwave background, which is the the radiation, the light, essentially the faded light of the fireball of the Big Bang that was released right back in the very earliest moments of, well, you know, 400,000 years after the Big Bang, that's 13.8 billion years ago. And by analyzing the patterns in that light, you can figure out what the properties of the early universe were like. So what did it contain? How much matter, how much dark matter, how much radiation, and so on. And then you can use Einstein's theory to run the clock forward to today. So you basically evolve the universe in time and you work out how fast it should be expanding now. And if you compare that sort of prediction based on the Big Bang with what you measure in the sky, they don't agree with each other. They don't line up. Right. And this, this, is, this problem emerged about a decade ago. And it's caused huge debate and argument, some of it quite bad tempered amongst different teams of cosmologists, some of whom think this is the real deal and it's the sign of something really profound. Other people think it's we can't really measure distances to galaxies accurately as we think we can, for example. But the explanations for this could be some new form of repulsive anti-gravity, a kind of dark energy that existed early in the universe, but changed through history. So we think of dark energy in the universe in the standard cosmology as being a constant. So it's just this repulsive force that makes the universe get bigger and bigger, but it stays the same throughout the history of the universe. This could be telling us that dark energy actually changes with time, that it's evolving with time, which would rewrite the history of the universe and tell us something about what was going on very early in the universe's history or it could be that actually you know the laws of gravity are not quite what we think they are which would be even more exciting there's basically a load of explanations for these things no one really knows what the right one is it's still a possibility that it's a glitch and you know it's a mistake in the measurements in these observations because they're very difficult but you know after a decade of people pouring over these things and trying to find the mistake no one has been able to find it so it does look like I mean, of all the anomalies in the book, I would say this one is perhaps the one that is the most compelling. And it really looks like it might be telling us something interesting about the universe. Hmm. And that could, I mean, if that were true, that could, as I understand it, rewrite a lot of what we understand about the history of the universe, couldn't it? Yeah. I mean, it's, it's really interesting when you talk to cosmologists about this problem, because I think one of the reasons, one of the reasons it became clear to me why people haven't accepted it, despite the fact the evidence for this anomaly has been around for a long time, is because there's no ready-made theoretical explanation for what's going on. There's like, actually one, so one of the, the people that is really pushing this, uh, these series of measurements of the expanding universe is a, a physicist called Adam Rees, Nobel Prize winner. He won the Nobel Prize uh, back in, well, for, for some work he did in the late 90s with two other leading physicists on where they discovered that the universe is accelerating, that the expansion of the universe is accelerating. And this was a surprise. It was a big surprise when people realized this. But actually, at the time, there was a ready-made explanation, which was that back in the early 20th century, Einstein, when he was writing down his equations of gravity, he had added this extra term to his equations called the cosmological constant, which was a sort of repulsive anti-gravitational thing. Um, which he later discarded and said it was a mistake. But actually, all you had to do to explain the accelerating universe was revive Einstein's cosmological constant. So it was a kind of ready-made solution. And people go, okay, space is expanding, it's accelerating, fine, it's the cosmological constant. But this time around, there isn't any really obvious explanation. None of the theoretical explanations like new forces, new types of dark energy, changing gravity, none of them really work perfectly. They can kind of help remove, like alleviate this tension between these two results, but they don't get rid of it completely. And I think that's why people have struggled to, to accept it. But I mean, what Adam Reese would say, and he said this to me is, you know, it's a bit of a weird perspective to say, well, I'm not going to ex accept an experimental measurement if there isn't a theoretical explanation for it, because that's not really how science works. Science is about looking at the world as we find it. And we just have to try and make sense of what the data is telling us, whether or not it fits neatly with our theory. So the jury is very much, I think, still out in terms of what is the cause of this. But I think it could well be the clue to some big shift in how we think about cosmology, which is an exciting place to be. Hmm, that is so cool. And um, there's some evidence now, as I understand, of a possible fifth force of nature. Well, yeah, perhaps. It depends whether you believe. So th this relates to some of the other anomalies in the book. So actually, 
the anomalies that I was working on, or I, I still do work on actually to some extent, they came from uh, these, these fundamental particles uh, that we study at the Large Hadron Collider called beauty quarks. So a, a quark is a fundamental particle that you find inside the nucleus of atoms. So every atom is made up of basically two different types of quark. There's something called an up quark and a down quark. Now, the beauty quark is a is like a super heavy version of the down quark. So it's, it's you don't find it in ordinary matter, but you can make these things in large quantities in the collisions at, at the LHC. And they're very interesting particles to study because the way they behave, the way they de- they're, they're unstable, they decay into other particles. And the way they decay can be quite strongly affected if there are other forces in nature. So the, the kind of game we play at the experiment is you collect lots of these things, you measure their properties, and then you compare with a theoretical prediction from our standard theory. And if you see a discrepancy, that could be a clue. So for some years, we had a series of anomalies that were building in the behavior of these beauty quarks that really did make it look like there was a new force potentially affecting how they were behaving. And it got very, particularly in 2021, there was this sort of peak of excitement where um, some more data was analyzed, this effect got even stronger. But unfortunately, about a year later, what was discovered is that some of these anomalies were being affected by a, a, essentially a, a bias that we hadn't properly accounted for, that we'd missed. These, these experiments are very complicated and you, you, know, you try really hard to do the best measurement you can, but sometimes you miss things. And in this case, unfortunately, we'd miss something, which was very subtle, but basically meant that some of these anomalies went away. So some of them are still there and they could still be the signs of something exciting. But the picture is now a bit more murky. Before it was kind of looking really like, you know, we're on the road to something. Uh, but that's actually, you know, one of the stories in the book. There's a chapter in the book about this whole roller coaster adventure where, you know, you kind of think you're about to make a, you know, Nobel Prize winning discovery and then you realize, ah, okay, we've we're gonna, we've made a mistake here. But that's sort of that's sort of what I wanted to bring out in the book as well, is how science actually works. It's not this kind of linear journey towards progress where you just take step after step. There are these false starts, you go backwards, you make mistakes. And it's actually this, so it's this kind of slightly messy self-correcting process, but eventually it gets you somewhere. So that was sort of, I think that's why it's an interesting story. But um, there's, there's those anomalies from the LHC. There are also other experiments around the world, one in, in Chicago at Fermilab, which has seen particles called muons that seem to be behaving in ways that we can't explain with our current theory. And that could also be hints of some new force of nature. So there are a bunch of these things out there. And it's the thing with anomalies is they are uncertain. And most of them do go away eventually. If you look at, if you take, you know, probably 50 anomalies, maybe only one of them will actually turn out to be the key discovery that leads to something big. But that's why you pursue them, because the payoff is so huge, even if most of them will fall by the wayside. So we're in this position in particle physics now where we have these anomalies we don't really know where this is going to lead and whether it's going to lead us something somewhere exciting or whether we're just going to learn more about the particles that we already have have discovered and, and sort of understand in our current theory. So we'll have to wait and see. Excellent. It's so exciting. And speaking of exciting, I would love to hear your thoughts on how you think that generative artificial intelligence could help weigh in on some of these questions and answers. I mean, it's a really good question. I mean, just in terms of my own day-to-day work, a lot of what, well, my job essentially is to analyze data from the Large Hadron Collider. So these detectors that we have produce huge quantities of data. You're looking for very, very rare signals usually in a a vast data set. So, you know, for a long time, we've been using machine learning, you know, deep neural networks, these kinds of things to identify the kind of little bit of gold in amongst all the, the sludge that comes out of these experiments. I should recall our data sludge, I suppose that's going to upset people. But, um, <laughs> so, so in some sense, it's, it's already, yeah. But in terms of sort of, if you're, if you're talking about sort of large language models and things like these, I mean, actually, you know, as I said, my day to day is coding. And actually, I'm, I'm a physicist, I'm not a computer scientist, I'm not a coder. I don't really I don't rejoice in coding for its own sake. So I'm kind of lazy. I will just sort of find something that works and then I'll just use it. And it's probably not the most elegant solution to how you should particularly, a computer scientist would look at my code and be horrified probably if I, what I've written. Um, but Some, the, the great thing about chat, G- <laughs> I was going to say, yeah, sometimes brute force works in coding. Yeah. Yeah. I mean, <laughs> it's worked for my career the last 10 years for me so far anyway, but I mean, the thing about chat GPT is, you know, if you don't know some language or you don't know how to script something, you can just say to it, I'm trying to do this, give me a piece of code and it will do it. And 
Sometimes it works, sometimes it doesn't, but usually even if it doesn't, it gives you most of the solution and you can kind of hack it and get it to work. So it's a real labor saving device at the moment, I would say already. And a lot of people are using it. And the experiment that I work on, it's a very complicated piece of hardware, but it's also got this huge software library that goes with it. And one of the real, if you're coming in as a new scientist to the experiment as a student, getting your head around all of this is really hard. And actually a lot of the, a lot of the code is actually available open source. So right. chat GPT yeah. knows about it. It's, it's, it's read it already. Yeah, exactly. And so you can even ask questions about some quite specific particle physics software, and it will tell you a reasonably good answer quite often. So in that very basic way, it's already having an effect. I think in the future, I mean, it's, it's quite difficult to, to say, I don't know where this is going to go in terms of, you know, will it be able to say, solve eventually theoretical physics problems that theorists struggle to, to get their heads around? I, I'm not really qualified to, to say, but it's already having a big impact. And I think it will, that, that will grow with time, I think. That's so cool. And so finally, just theoretical question. Do you have an alien come down and says, I have the answers to uh, all of the questions in your mind and I'll answer one of them for you? Which one, which, one, which question do you want answered and how come? Oh, goodness. That is a good one. Thing is, I don't know if I'd want to just be told the answer because the the joy of science is what Feynman said, you know, it's the pleasure of finding things out. So just being told something is is not so satisfying. So maybe I'd ask something like, you know, if we want to know about dark matter, tell me what experiment we should build, you know, what, what kind of give us a clue what direction, but I'd, I'd want to go and do the, the investigation myself. I don't think I just want to be given the answer on a plate. That'd be a bit, un it's a bit like being at school It's it actually the excitement of science comes from the, the activity of scientific discovery, I think. That's, that's beautiful. Well, thanks so much for being on the show, Harry. It was great talking with you. Lovely talking to you too. Thanks for having me. Yeah, and that was uh, Harry Cliff. Check out his new book, Space Odysseys, the Mysterious Anomalies Challenging Our Understanding of the Universe. Wherever you get it, wherever you get your awesome science books. Welcome to the exciting world of beauty quarks at the Large Hadron Collider's LHCB experiment. Matter is made up of atoms containing electron clouds surrounding nuclei of protons and neutrons. Now these later particles are themselves composed of smaller constituent particles called quarks, which come in six varieties. Bottom quarks, nicknamed beauty quarks, are not typically found in nature, but are produced by particle accelerators like, like the one at CERN. Now, oddly, beauty quarks aren't decaying as expected, and that's got physicists scratching their heads. Again, these anomalies might hint at undiscovered particles or maybe a new force challenging our understanding of the universe. Typically, there are four known forces in play throughout the universe. There's gravity, holding us to our handy dandy seats, electromagnetism, providing us with light, radio, and the joy of playing with magnets. The other two forces are the strong force, which holds the nucleus of atoms together, and the weak force, which releases electrons called beta radiation. Subatomic particles called muons have an identical charge to electrons, but can possess 200 times their mass. The standard model of physics, one of the mainstays of science, suggests that beauty quarks should decay into equal numbers of muons and electrons. However, these decays unexpectedly form more electrons than muons. Our researchers have uncovered evidence that muons might reveal an unseen particle called leptoquarks. Did ye say leprechaun quark, lad? Old Patrick O'Flanagan be in luck this morn. Or maybe an odd new force of nature. Okay, something about her was odd, but I could tell she was a force of nature. Now, most astronomers today agree that the universe is expanding and the further away galaxies are, the faster they're traveling. This begs the question, how fast is that? 
Yeah, how fast is that? There are two ways to figure this out. Now, one of them is to examine the cosmic microwave background radiation, or CMB, an echo from the Big Bang. Now, this serves as kind of like a baby picture of the cosmos. And the second way is to measure the distances to galaxies using predictable Cepheid variable stars, figure out their distance, measure their velocities, and you get your answer. The more distant galaxies are from one another, the faster they are receding. Cool. A number of extremely precise measurements have been made each way and they don't agree with one another. The Hubble tension, a clash between observations of the early universe and current measurements of its expansion rate, implies we may need to rethink dark energy, dark matter, and or gravity's role in the universe. Now, none of these intriguing anomalies have presented proof of unknown forces or particles in, in nature. However, they do give us a glimpse of the great questions of physics to be unraveled in the coming decades. Next week, we're offering up an eclipse viewing guide for the solar eclipse coming to North America on the 8th of April. Make sure to join us two days before uh, on Saturday the 6th and learn how to best see this rare event. And so please subscribe, share, follow, tell your friends about the show, rent billboards telling people about us. They much appreciated. Clear skies. Sleep.